start with this um, scientist that first, uh, I would say, stumbled upon uh, this process by virtue of studying digestive processes. So many times in science, this is what happens. We are set up to uh, discover something or at the very least study something, and we discover something completely different, sometimes even in a field that has nothing or almost nothing to do with the field our study was based upon. So his name is Ivan Pablo, or in our letters, Ivan Pavlov, and he is one of the most important scientists that we will uh, discuss this semester. So Ivan Pavlov, as the father of a perspective in psychology called behaviorism, or one of the fathers of what uh, came to be called behaviorism, and this is where we start today. So let's add the description first, and we'll have a little discussion about it. So first concept to keep in mind in this uh, section on learning and conditioning, we will be talking about behaviorism. So as the name implies, behaviorism is a perspective that focuses on behavior, right? So this is something that is connected to the first lecture we had when we were debating what approach to take uh, in psychology. Now, you probably have heard of um, certain perspectives that take for uh, granted that we are complex beings and the way to study human behavior is in itself far beyond what empirical sciences can actually demonstrate or investigate. Now, there are other scientists that take a completely different approach, um, and the approach is predicated upon what type of, I would say, style or school of thought they embrace. Now, behaviorism really means we are studying behavior. Now, by behavior, okay, we should remember the triad that we encounter in week one, the CBT triad, the cognitive behavioral triad, that of course involves behavior, involves cognition, right? Cognition, and involves emotion, right? So this triad, behavior, cognition, and emotion. Now, um, this is already making a statement, a statement according to which we are at the very least made up as human beings of three parts, three processes, perhaps three mechanisms, we'll see. Now, behaviorism tends to uh, view behavior as not necessarily the most important in ontological terms. If you remember, ontology refers to what is, right? Ontology, okay, okay to the... Um, the, the existence itself, the essence, uh, more than existence, on in, in Greek. And, um, and we will not spend too much time on this, you know, existence over essence, essence over existence. We, we take the postmodernist actually for, for a different uh, lecture. But the ontology of, of, of uh, human essence, so to speak, is in behaviorism, not so much about the fact that we are only our behavior, but the fact that our behavior is what we can study, what we can observe, and therefore we can make certain um, assumptions and claims about uh, certain predictability of what we are studying, which is exactly what science is doing, right? Science is also about predictive power to tell you, based on all the studies we have, what will happen if you have the same condition, the same patterns, the same variables, and so on and so forth. So behaviorism, we study behavior first and foremost. Now, um, in the um, example I just mentioned, the one by Ivan Pavlov, um, he is very well known for the, so to speak, the so-called salivating dog experiment, the salivating dog experiment. And this is something that is part of psychological literature for now 150 years or so, even more. Um, and um, it's pretty much about the fact that Ivan Pavlov was studying the digestive processes in animals. 
uh, as we do, you know, with animal modeling throughout um, social sciences and uh, empirical sciences, and find out that the dog was responding to specific stimuli. Okay, so stimulus and response are the two terms that we will begin with in this conversation. Stimulus, stimulus, and response. Okay, stimulus and response. Now, you will see that this lecture will have a lot of terms, and these terms are, for the most part, quite easy to understand, but it can also be very confusing. This lecture is one of those lectures or one of those lecture content um, upon which people stumble um, because there's a lot of terminology that sometimes appears to mean the same thing in a slightly different way and is an essential part of uh, the, the psychological exam that uh, you might need to take if one day you want to become a clinical uh, psychologist, the EPPP, at least in the United States. And this is something that I can guarantee you will be part of the questions the board will ask you. And so the best way to learn this is by virtue of having examples. So uh, my advice will be this. Uh, review this lecture a few times. I will use a lot of slides with a lot of examples and then try to come up with your own examples to associate this label, this term to that situation, to that process, to that outcome. Okay. So stimulus response. In the case of Pablo, we have a salivating dog that is responding in a certain way, in a behavioral way to certain things happening. So the association was the association between food and salivation. Okay? So this is the basic thing. We're thinking about associating or pairing. Okay? That's a term that we utilize in psychology, is pairing two variables. Okay? So there's a pair of variables. And if you remember from what we discussed in week one, this is how we study uh, these behavioral processes by having certain um, variables that we observe and we see whether we can link them some way. And if you remember, we discussed the difference between correlation and causation. This is what we're trying to do here to see whether there is some sort of connection between this stimulus and response. All right, so what did happen in this um, experiment or rather than what happened in this experiment, what did Pablo observe? So Pablo was giving food to the uh, animals that he was working with, to these dogs. And um, he noticed, as you probably would expect, that uh, upon arrival on the scene, upon the arrival of the food on the scene, the dog would start to salivate. Nothing surprising here or nothing too surprising, right? Because after all, this is something that we can also encounter as human beings, right? When you're hungry, you will react a certain way. You might start to salivate. You might start to feel a different way if you're hungry, if you're thirsty. So there's some sort of expectation, if nothing else, right? Now, the interesting thing is that um, when the food arrived, there was something else that was happening, okay? In the classical description of the experiment, there was a bell, okay? This, this uh, auditory stimulation, okay? So a bell, just turn this on. All right. So there was a bell again, a bell that we would call neutral stimulus, neutral stimulus, okay? That happened, for now, let's just think of it, happened at the time of presentation of the food. Whether it was simultaneous or not is something that we'll discuss later on. But for now, let's associate the concept of stimulus, but not only random stimulus, a neutral stimulus to the bell, okay? So why neutral stimulus to the bell? Because you also have the food, okay? Which we will call the unconditioned, unconditioned stimulus, all right? So you have two stimuli here, or stimuli, if you really want to pronounce it the correct way in Latin, that do two things. Well, in terms of stimulus itself, we don't have to spend too much time on the concept. That's pretty straightforward. It's something that is happening, something that is, we could assume, motivating a certain action or behavior. We are stimulated, the animal is stimulated, okay? But you see that there are two different natures of this stimulus. Okay? One is neutral, okay? So for now, nothing happened, nothing happened yet, or this is not paired with anything else. 
neutral, if you remember from other lectures, uh, is a concept that means neither or. Okay, if you remember the mathematical binary system that we briefly discussed, and this is not a class in mathematics, but this is really referring to the zero one perspective, right? The binary system that yes, no, on and off, etc. Neutral means neither, okay, neither, so neither one uh, nor zero, okay, neither. Interesting enough, and it's something also mentioned all the time, this is from the Latin ne uter, right? Because in a um, symbolic, etymological form, the uter, the uterus, is the one that gives birth or creates two polar opposites either uh, a boy or a girl, ne uter, that's where the uh, term comes from. So neutral stimulus simply means it's nothing, it just exists for now, okay? It's not associated, it's not paired, okay? Think of binary as, again, paired, right? Two, right, with anything else, it just exists, okay? The food is also uh, a stimulus, but at this level is unconditioned. What does it mean? The food does what it does, okay? The food, you could say naturally, makes the person wants to eat it at this level or makes the subject, the animal, eat it at this level. Now, there's also something else now that we will call, uh, please here, response, okay? Response, okay? Response, which would be salivation, okay? Salivation. And you can guess what type of response are we having here? Again, imagine the situation, Dr. Pavlov enters the lab, the, the room, okay? brings food and rings the bell, or his assistant rings the bell. Okay, so that's what you have. The dog starts to salivate. Okay, question: Do you think the dog is actually thinking about salivating upon seeing the food? Is the dog rehearsing some sort of uh, behavior because Dr. Pavlov told the dog to do so, or is simply a let me use the term natural response at this point? Well, it is a natural response, which is associated to the food in itself, right? So unconditioned is what we will call it, okay? So look at this. A good way to remember that is that there are two pairs. Let me see if I can actually clean up a little bit here to associate some of the colors, okay? And if you remember this, I would say you you mess already 30% of this lecture, okay? It's, it's really it's really important to just get the terms right. And not, nothing too crazy at this point, nothing too, too difficult. We're talking about stimulus and response, okay? A and B mechanism, okay? So in, in, in psychology, sometimes we do this. Stimulus, response, something like that. Very, very basic, okay? At this level, okay, we are talking about very specific Let's call it sub branch or uh, or basic um, tenet of behaviorism. Okay, we are talking about conditioning, conditioning. Now, since Pavlov is so important in the field of psychology, this became a classic. So we call this classic conditioning. Okay, classic conditioning. We will see there are other types of conditioning that we will uh, um, encounter today. So good way to learn this. Where is it now? Let me see. So you have bell, food, and salivation. You have two stimuli, one and two, okay? One and two, and two unconditioned elements, okay? Now, this uh, always reminds me of the pentatonic scale. If you are guitar players, you know, when, when I was younger, I was playing in, in uh, heavy metal bands. You know, I had all my, my shapes on my neck, right? So you, you practice the pentatonic scale to do kind of some shredding and, and uh, uh, solos. And so you have certain shapes that always, you know, come in handy if you want to trans, um, transcribe the, the, the scale on different levels on your, on your neck on your guitar. This is something similar. So you have stimulus, stimulus, um, unconditioned, unconditioned. Okay? And it's a really good way to look at it. Now, let's review this one more time. The food arrives, okay? And at the same time, for now, the bell is rang. So you have a neutral stimulus that just exists. You have an unconditioned stimulus, which means something is about to happen. We don't know yet. 
and then you have an unconditioned response. It's just there. All right, so let's use acronyms to better define this. I will use the same color. So we have blue for NS, okay, neutral stimulus, okay. Then we have black for US, unconditioned stimulus, okay. And then we use the green for UR, unconditioned response, okay. I will use now the red color to link these three in a sequential manner, okay? So very often, this is what you're gonna find in quizzes or in examination in psychology, where you study behaviorism. You have NS, US, UR, okay? And you should remember what this means as long as the question clearly identifies this as part of behaviorism or classical conditioning, okay? So from a neutral stimulus, okay, you associate a fogolos, a segue, an unconditioned stimulus, and then what you have is an unconditioned response, okay? Now what's going to happen is that this will be conditioned, okay? So what Pablo was able to demonstrate, again, not because that was the scope of the research, but because it was, was observed over and over again, repetition, is that Pavlov was able to remove the food, okay, from the equation, and the dog will start to salivate only by hearing the bell, okay? Or in other words, the bell was enough to make the dog salivate. So what's happening here? What's happening is called conditioning, and the bell is kept, okay? So the stimulus is kept, all right? The response is also kept, okay? The response is also kept. You no longer have the uh, food as an element, okay? So this doesn't follow anymore, okay? And so what's happening here, we delete this, you have a connection straight from the stimulus to the response We a big chain in both cases, those two become conditioned. So you have a conditioned stimulus, conditioned stimulus, okay? In this case, the bell, okay? The bell, bring the bell. And you will obtain a conditioned, conditioned, response okay so please take a long time to review this because this is really the basic uh tenet of behaviorism okay how to go from ns us you are to cs and cr how to demonstrate condition now as i mentioned if you just observe this it doesn't really require a lot of uh you know, neuroscientific knowledge, you just observe a dog, you can expect that, hey, something is happening here. But to represent that, this starts to become complicated because you have all these acronyms. So this might also lead us to other consideration. How free are we as human beings? How conditionable are we? And this is a question that it's linked to um, um, free will, free want, what type of agency, what type of freedom and liberty we have. And then we'll see what psychology as a science has to tell us in this regard. Second uh, problem, is this all there is? What about other types of connection also within classical conditioning, also within Pavlovian conditioning? All right, so let's see, first of all, if this is a um, process that occurs over and over again, or there's any, any uh, I don't know, any specific situation that we find ourselves in. So let's let's keep this here for a second. I'll just keep the, the um, acronyms here. And this is what we should keep in mind. So at this point, we are observing conditioning, okay? Conditioning is what we observe, conditioning. So the subject, the dog in this case, but let me already say that all of the things that I will be discussing today, for the most part, are applicable to human behavior as well. There are differences, but we'll discuss this later. So conditioning from this perspective is something happening as a result of this, okay? So 
there is a certain type of behavior, in this case, salivation, that we can apply to, to other behavior that is acquired, okay, from the subject. So we will talk about acquisition of a behavior, okay? Acquisition of the behavior. Now, acquisition in this context simply means learning, right? Learning, you learn a new behavior. Now, at this level, this is already fascinating because sometimes we associate negative things to being conditioned to do something. It almost feels that we are being brainwashed or, or, or we are victim of propaganda. We discussed propaganda last week. Um, and this is definitely true to some extent, okay? But there is something that occurred. We can also see this as a, um, a um, process uh, whereby we can increase certain skills, okay? We'll see that there is a different types of conditioning, operant conditioning, where this will be relevant if you want to increase or decrease your behavior. But for now, we have acquisition. So something starts. Now you might wonder, will this start forever? Will this dog always salivate uh, after uh, hearing the bell, and the answer, even just by experience, will be no, okay? Because you could say the dog is not a fool, okay? And so the dog, after a while, will know that there is no longer a food associated or paired with the bell. So you can keep ringing the bell, but the dog will not believe you anymore. Now, whether it's a question of belief or not, we'll discuss this in philosophical terms later on, but for now, we are observing an extinction, okay? There is an extinction, okay? So there is no longer this pairing process whereby you can skip this and go straight to the conditional response. Eventually, this will fade, okay? There will be an extinction, okay? So uh, you go back to uh, stage one. One more thing. Now, um, there is also a, a spontaneous recovery from what the, in this case, the dog experienced. So you go back to baseline. But the interesting thing is that, let's say you have all these experiments done, let's say last week, and then nothing happens for the next four or five days. Okay. So there is a full extinction, etc. Now you start to do that again. Okay. You start to reassociate, repair um the bell with the food okay and after a while this will start to reoccur okay so the 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 dog will relearn okay or rather rediscover okay what has been uh extinguished extinct okay and this happens actually much much faster which is fascinating because it's the basic of learning anything right that's why i always say when when um, you approach a new topic try to read or try to, in this case, watch the lecture, you might or might not pay too much attention to it, just enjoy it, well, hopefully, um, and then do it again. Go back and watch it a second or a third time, this time trying to pay attention to each part of it, because this will recreate a very similar scenario, scenario whereby the learning process will be enhanced, okay? We'll see how that happens. So you have extinction, you have the acquisition process, and then you have faster learning curve after that. So uh, one more thing, um, uh, what if, what if instead of a bell, Pablo use a different type of bell? Well, the interesting thing that um, happens is when we process different things, so let's try to do this uh, together. Uh, I will play a little, um, a little um, note here and I will do something. All right, so uh, this shows that we are more attuned. Okay, let me just use this term, attuned, right? Attuned to a specific, pun intended, tune, okay? 
a specific tune. So the um, the mathematical structure upon which music is based actually makes sense psychologically and neurophysiologically speaking. So when we listen to the same note, okay, or rather the note um, performed or played into different octaves, okay, we will recognize the third octave, for instance, of the note as the same thing as the previous one, whereby we will not react the same way to any other random note, although they might be within the same scale, okay, so in the same uh, octave. Uh, interesting enough, this is applicable to a variety of things that, uh, again, have um, behaviorism as the primary way to interpret reality. So what we learned so far is that you have, again, um, a neutral stimulus that it is um, uh, becoming a conditioned stimulus and an unconditioned response that was previously caused by an unconditioned stimulus um, and becomes conditional response. Now, we also mentioned that uh, we have this a stimulus generalization, right? Stimulus generalization, whereby we can have the same generalization, whereby we can have the same response despite the fact that the stimuli might be slightly different because we are able to generalize them as part of the same thing. Example, two different octaves in the same note. Now, this also means the opposite, that at the same time, we have stimulus discrimination, okay? And that's why discrimination is so important and so um, so fundamental in psychology. We are able to discriminate against things that do not uh, belong to the same uh, container, cognitive container. For instance, if I were to do this, right, I will uh, um, add different shapes here, okay? Um, to this um, board, okay. Maybe one more color, right? Etc. Different shapes. Then, depending on what I am asked to pay attention to, and this can be subconscious or conscious or modulated, we'll see this when we will discuss uh, attentive processes, we will discriminate and generalize depending on what type of questions we have been asked. Example, we might be able to recognize shapes only and the color comes afterwards. So for instance, we are uh, doing this and using the blue color. We only want to identify circles, okay? Little balls, little um, spheres here. So. We will do this, we will generalize this, okay? There's one more here, but let's pretend that there's only three. We'll generalize the ball despite or against the fact that colors are different, okay? At the same time, we will discriminate the green circle against other green shapes. We will discriminate the uh, black circle against other black shapes and so on and so forth for the red one, okay? Same thing, we can do the opposite, okay? So this time, shape dominates, shape over color, but we will do the opposite. We can decide to do, let's explain this one, color over shape. So for instance, I might generalize the red color, okay? The red color against every other color. So I'm generalizing the, the 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 color over the shape. So in other words, it doesn't matter if this is a star, this is a um, square, and this is a circle, and this is I don't know, peanut, perhaps. They're all red. Okay. So color dominates. So I generalize, but at the same time, I discriminate against shapes that are the same but in different colors. Okay. So psychologically speaking, this is also what happens if you play poker, for instance, or any other card game. Okay. So generalization and discrimination. Now uh, you might wonder, okay, uh, so this can be applicable to a variety of scenarios whereby we can, uh, for instance, associate things that we want the person to learn. Okay, so beside the salivating dog um, and the food, you can think of behavioral context where you want to teach something to uh, your child, for instance, okay? You associate certain stimulus, stimuli that are uh, positive and you pair them with something else you want to, for instance, uh, uh, observe as a result. Example, 
uh, I don't know, your child doesn't like uh, specific vegetables, for instance. I struggle with it because I always love my veggies. So uh, it's hard for me to understand why, why you really like them. Uh, but in any case, um, uh, the child might not like certain veggies. And so you associate that with something that they like, uh, I don't know, um, a bread that they really, really like. And then you present them together. So their response will be modulated by the fact that one will override the other. So at this time, you might, you might have that as, um, as, as an example. And this might also be um, 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 created by the fact you can have a second order conditioning. Okay, So you might have, I don't know, in the case of the dog, you might have not just the bell, but this time you, instead of just an auditory simulation, you add an audio visual simulation. You have a bell and you have a light, and then you have the conditional response, so second uh, order condition. But then you may also wonder, OK, uh, is this only one way? Uh, can we improve behavior? What about what about conditioning in the context of trauma? Okay. What about negative effects? So we, we talked about the possibility of teaching something good, behaviorally speaking, to a child. What about installing fear? Now, you might wonder, why would you possibly do that in a child? Well, besides the fact that fear in itself, it's not a negative term, concept, or behavioral uh, structure, and okay? we need fear in life to, to teach us to be safe, for instance, in certain situations, and it's more a question of, of a grain of a scale and a context-based situation, but there is a horrible experiment, a disgusting experiment from an ethical standpoint that was performed by Watson called the Little Albert Experiment, okay, Little, little Albert Experiment, whereby what was demonstrated or observed, okay, uh, induced, was aversive condition, okay, aversive condition. All right, so the next one, uh, John Watson and Rosalie Rayner, a very infamous uh, experiment, uh, Little Albert. Um, there's a lot of things that can be said about these experiments. Um, well, starting from the private life of John Watson that uh, eventually ended up marrying uh, his students, uh, uh, Rosalie Rayner, and uh, not, not itself a, a, a demonstration of the unethics uh, behind the experiment, but the, 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 the experiment itself is it's really, really creating a lot, a lot of issues from the perspective of, uh, uh, of uh, bioethical models. So... Little Albert, of course, is not the real name of the child subject that Watson utilized in this horrible experiment. Um, but um, what happened is that there was this child um, that was uh, observed interacting with, with a mouse, with a rat, um, and the rat itself did not have any negative connotation uh, to the child. But then the, the, the rat itself was paired with a negative, a a traumatizing um, action, the hammer, and those two elements were then paired. And so the child started to experience fear associated with something that previously was not fear inducing, the rat. Okay. There are different versions of this experiment with the rabbit. The, the idea is exactly the same. Something that's not scary to begin with, a pet, for instance, can made to become scary by virtue of pairing something within aversive conditioning. So the child can be traumatized as a result of that. And unfortunately, this can happen in a variety of settings and it's, it's, it's horrible. And, uh, and I, you know, I'm, very, I'm very sensitive to this. I'm a father myself. So uh, there are uh, very strong ethical limitations in uh, science, especially within uh, social sciences and even more within psychology. Uh, hopefully we learned a lesson, and one would hope so, and yet again, this did not happen 500 years ago. It happened only in the last century. So it's, it's really, really um, uh, hard to discuss that. All right. So this is uh, the, the original footage of the, the experiment, the little other experiment by, by Watson, re-edited, of course, for copyright reasons. And so he wants to show that a normal nine-month-old uh, little infant could be conditioned to have a fear, phobia of something that the child was not afraid of before this experiment. So... You can see that he's presenting here an object uh, like a, a dog or a monkey or a rabbit, okay? That and then eventually a white rather a different version of, of, of this experiment. You can see right here, he kind of here as it reacts. And and you know, he's not overreacting, he's uh he seems to engage, you know, he seems to um have you know a, 
connection, and at least not a fearful response, right? Um, you can see here that you know it seems to figure out what, what the rabbit is doing, um, and, and um, seems to to not have any 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 real reason to fear what's going on. Okay, and um, and now we see that the the white rats and here again, little Albert is kind of figuring out what what what's going on, just interacting, kind of uh, amazed, maybe surprised, but not fearful, right? And um, and now the conditioning starts each time Albert feels this iron rod. Okay, it was it was crying now because the iron just hit it. And now the what what what, what happens is that uh, he this time he cries right away because there was a pairing, right? So he has a negative reaction when this dog is introduced now, and he starts to be agitated, and starts to cry. Um, and um, it, it's 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 a horrible thing to to observe. Why would you abuse a child like that? Um, and uh, after this this um, the, the 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 immune response, the, this seal for code is is also presented, and he's already anxious, but not as responsive as before. But uh, and this is a mess that that Watson puts on also to scare the child. It's a really really uh, horrible experiment to to observe and uh, and, and yet again it's um, it's uh, one of those experiments that uh, proved the point according to Watson, but didn't really uh, add much to uh, the the ethics of the experiment itself. Okay, now the question may be, okay, can we do something about it? If a person is traumatized by a certain thing, uh, regardless of the situation that conditioned this uh, response, can we unlearn this? Can there be something like a counter conditioning of fear of trauma? And this is what we will discuss next. So counter conditioning, counter conditioning, conditioning, uh, let's call it of fear because it's one of the primordial emotional responses or emotion. We'll see. Uh, we, we, we will uh, uh, study uh, emotions and um, universal facial expressions uh, related to emotions um, in a different lecture. Um, but for now, let's think about counter conditions. So imagine that there is something positive. I don't know. Uh, I think that the textbook uses the usual milk okay thinking about a child here okay let's use the usual milk and cookies okay etc okay so these will be the good things okay the, the check mark let me just do this we associate this with happy okay a happy face okay okay and then let's assume that there is something negative down here okay uh, for instance, I don't know, um, the child um, might be scared of, I don't know, a, what could it be a good example? Uh, the child might be scared of, I don't know, a spiky ball, okay? A, a rubber ball, it's spiky, okay? It has all these spikes here. And let's assume that this is a, um, a ball that, uh, his brother likes to play with it, and it's not something you know truly dangerous. It's just a rubber ball or a soft ball, but it's just the shape itself that makes the child feel uncomfortable. So the idea is, how can we connect pair these two things so that the child will be happy? Okay. If these two things are associated, so the ultimate result will be that this will lead to happiness in general. So let's use what we just said. So what could happen here? So first of all, you may have an unconditioned stimulus, okay? An unconditioned stimulus here, okay? That will uh, have, as a result, an unconditioned response, okay? Same thing here. You have an unconditioned uh, stimulus, negative that will create an unconditional response okay what we want to do is now connect this okay to this okay and then as a result this so once you have this when you have a the connection between two you, you have a conditioned stimulus right with a new 
let's call it N, conditioned response right here. So this is what happens. You are counter conditioning fear by virtue of uh, reassociating, repairing this in this sequence. Now, as you can imagine, this has a variety of application. For instance, when we think about placebo and nocebo effect, we discuss this in um, uh, biomedical sciences, especially when we discuss um, um, statistics, biostatistics, and epidemiology. Placebo effect versus nocebo effect. If you remember, these two terms mean I shall please or will please, and I shan't please, I shall not please. Placebo is what happens, the process that happens when something stimulates a positive response despite the fact that you don't have a real, quote unquote, stimulus there. Example, um, the, you, you're happy about um, the presence of a certain thing, this part of that this thing does not do actually what it's supposed to do. We use this, for instance, when we study uh, placebo effect sugar pills, okay, to discuss, sorry, to study whether a medication works or not. If you get a sugar pill and you feel better afterward, the placebo effect happens. Um, and so you could say that this could be associated with this conditioning element and the opposite for the nocebo effect. Example, you might be afraid of shots, okay? And you start to associate, to pair the shot to the hospital itself, and you might start to develop this white coat syndrome, which is not a real syndrome, but you start to develop fear of hospital, fear of clinics, fear of doctors, the doctor doctorizing the MDs. Um, and so regardless of the fact that you might or might not get a shot, you start to have this nocebo effect as a result of it. So counter conditional fear is exactly what you do in order to uh, bypass this, this problem. So at, at this level, uh, there might be a one question. Okay, uh, so are we are we just victims of propaganda and brainwashing? Is there anything akin to some sort of free will or we cannot help by responding to something that's been previously conditioned? We cannot help by changing our response. Well, philosophically speaking, this is a lot to uh, to discuss and we will we'll do this in, in the next few weeks. Um, but there's always a space, okay, space slash time between stimulus and response. Just think about something as simple as count till 10 before you say something to someone that might have triggered you or offended you, okay? Um, sometimes just putting some space between stimulus and response is enough to reduce the intensity of the response itself. And this is how you demonstrate that scientifically. Um, we know instinctually and, and philosophically that we need to, so to speak, calm down before we react or overreact. But these are experiments clearly indicate how that happens. Now, you might wonder, okay, uh, is there anything as um, similar to an agency there whereby the person is not just a subject that's passive towards conditioning, but takes more of an active role? The answer is yes, and it's called operant conditioning. So let's switch gears here a little bit. I always do this when I say switch gears because as Europeans, I I love to try standard, okay? So that, that, that is actually a conditional response. Every time I say I switch gear, you know, I imagine this gated shift of my Ferrari and, and do that. All right, so from classical conditioning to operant conditioning, operant conditioning, okay? And operant conditioning, is the work of many, many, many psychologists, but I would like you to remember two names, at least Thorndike, okay? Thorndike, okay? and Skinner, okay, these two, okay? Both uh, instrumental to uh, discuss conditioning, uh, operant conditioning uh, in, uh, in uh, modern psychological science. So what do we mean by operant conditioning? Well, we'll go from an environment of pretty much stimulus and response, right? Which was our classical conditioning. And of course, unconditioned, conditioned, neutral, et cetera. But stimulus response to something that's a little more complicated, okay? That will require a little more uh, of a, um, an example making process to understand. Operant conditioning has less to do with only stimulus and response but more with behavior itself, okay? But, you know, more specifically, behavior as 
plus or minus, okay? When we think about other aspects of uh, uh, conditioning, you have blocking contiguity, we just mentioned, and continuity. With blocking indicating where novel stimuli are presented in compound with an existing condition stimulus, they will not create learning. That okay? novel stimuli in compound with an existing condition stimulus will not create learning. Okay? In continuity, instead, you have the condition stimulus, but the unconditioned stimulus, which is the representation of connectedness of two stimuli in time and space. And contingency, of course, the predictability of one stimulus from the presence of another one. Now, uh, so this is connected to the property of cause and condition. So you have you know, blocking, you have extinction, of course, generalization, uh, gradient, discrimination, training, as we will see. You have, uh, for instance, uh, different squares, black condition stimulus, and gray. Um, and then you have second order conditioning. We associate the bell with another type of stimulus. It can be a black square, it can be um, a, a, a light. Uh, and then there's temporal contiguity, uh, which is the basis of classical conditioning. Um, and and um, it, it's, it's, it's uh, a question that uh, we, we, we need to ask. So when you have the comparison between extinction, okay? So after uh, multiple non-reinforced trials, you'll see that the line will go down versus generalization. You'll see there is a peak, okay? A uh, peak of percentage of trial in which the condition responds to what was made. So you have this peak like a mountain um, after which you have this, uh, this um, uh, down, down, uh, um, down uh, um, reading with object. All right, great. Next up, the Rescorla, Rescorla Bagna model. And this is connected to be uh, a salient element as a reliable predictor, okay? Or a salient element uh, as opposed to something that's not uh, really important. So this is this is happening, for instance, when you when you try to pair something that makes sense, okay? And uh, in, in the image here, you see the bowl plus the bell plus the light and the salivating dog. So you can have an order, a second order conditioning where you can have the bell and the light at the same time. But the interesting thing is that uh, if you present them at the same time, then this will reinforce, I mean, borrowing this term, not from operant conditioning, but you know, in a general sense, the, the response. But otherwise, if the dog or the son is able to separate that, you don't have any added information, which in the end removes the, 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 the strength from what, what, what you observe. So um, this is very, very important because uh, the, the timing, the timing is as important. So in other words, you're more likely to be conditioned if what the stimulus that is paired is represented gives you extra information. So in other words, every time you hear the bell, you already associate the bell with food, you will start to salivate. But then if you had something that is added to it, you might not have more information. For instance, if you add um, you know, a light turns on, or black square, or um, I don't know, a pencil that is dropped or whatever it is, then it doesn't give you enough extra information. So you might not have the same type uh, of attachment in a uh, behavioral sense. Now we'll see how that plays a role when we when we talk about operant condition, which is really fascinating when we talk about the type of uh, um, stimulus that we want to, uh, to uh, obtain here. Now, when we think about different types of conditioning, you have delay conditioning, you have trace conditioning, you have context conditioning, and reverse conditioning, okay? Uh, each of which play a very, very important role. All right, so in, in this slide, we see different types of conditioning. Again, you have US, unconditioned stimulus, C, conditioned stimulus, and you have A, B, C, and D uh, with, with different colors, so purple, uh, blue, uh, orange, and yellow. You have delay conditioning, you have trace conditioning, you see the separation there, the tone, right? Context conditioning, and then reverse conditioning. And the question is, 
uh, what, what's what's the the difference between delay conditioning and trace conditioning, even in classical conditioning? Well, in delay conditioning, the U.S. the unconditioned stimulus immediately follows or co-terminates with a conditioned stimulus. Whereas in trace conditioning, the, um, the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus are separated in time by a trace, which is this trace interval. All right. So um, another question that you know, uh, you know, in, we could ask um, in, in science is why, 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 why does this matter? Why, why trace and delay conditioning are are um, are important? Well. Uh, we cannot spend too much time in this context. This is just an intro to classical conditioning, but uh, the hippocampus simply play a very important role, as you can imagine, because the hippocampus is always connected to what? To memory, right? So it, it is this, this model uh, is, is uh, identified the hippocampal region as the mediator of the representation of temporal information in uh, conditioning. So you, you can see that this is this really, really important that that the, this delay conditioning, where, where the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus overlap, right, and the coterminate, uh, is independent or not from the hippocampal system, versus trace conditioning, which, as you know, we just mentioned, that the, the CS terminates before the the US onset. This depends on the hippocampus, and again, it's 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 interesting because it has to do with with uh, um, with the, with the perception of time, all right. So, um, what what's what's another example of of uh, conditioning? Well, the last one in yellow is, is reverse conditioning, right? Or, or also called backward conditioning. In, in this of conditioning, the non neutral stimulus is presented before the neutral stimulus. For instance, where if you if you give a child a piece of cake, for instance, right, the, the cake is a non neutral stimulus for obvious reason, or they don't like the cake, uh, before going to the dentist, which is a neutral stimulus. Okay. All right. So uh, let's continue um, now. Uh, if we think about time and space in conditioning, we think about a basic conditioning curve. Okay, where you have acquisition, extinction. And then uh, spontaneous recovery, which is exactly how conditioning happens. You see the pause there in this kind of gray, dark gray uh, area, which is the rest period. And the curve uh, that you can see going up and down is the representation of the how how strong the um, the, the 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 response is going to be, the conditional response. So you see from low to high, acquisition goes upward, uh, conditioned stimulus plus unconditioned stimulus. Then with the extinction in orange, uh, it goes down because you have the condition stimulus alone. Then you have this, this, this break, right? Uh, and then you have the spontaneous recovery of the condition response in green. And then finally, the extinction with the condition uh, stimulus alone. So we're covering a lot uh, this week, but uh, this is another very direct application of um, operant conditioning and conditioning in general in terms of understanding uh, learning and, and, and behavioral patterns of human beings. Uh, the concept of learned helplessness. Uh, wh why do we get depressed? Why do we get sad? That's one of the most fascinating uh, questions in all of psychology. And we will discuss psychopathology, we'll discuss psychotherapy, we will discuss further the, the, the role of neurotransmitter of chemistry, et cetera, in feeling a certain way, in um, uh, receiving a mental health uh, disorders, diagnosis, the relation with DSM, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, some of the experiments are, are fascinating in, in connecting uh, behavior, mood, perception, self-perception, and even self-identity, right? So uh, Seligman is one of the, the, the most fascinating uh, psychologists, Martin Seligman, right? And, and um, he was not the first one really to use the term uh, learn helplessness, okay? But it's one of the, the, the psychologists that popularized the term more than anybody else, at least at that stage. And so long story short, you can see the image here. There, there's a dog there, right? So uh, he, he would pretty much ring a bell. The bell seems to be a... <laughs> Um, uh, returning feature of, of uh, conditioning, and he will give a light shock to a dog. Again, we're not here to discuss the uh, ethics of the experiments um, and, and the, 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 the horrible outcomes for the subject involved, but 
The point is that after a number of times, a number of times of ring the bell, giving uh, this shock to the dog, the dog actually reacted to the shock even before it happened. Okay, so as soon as the bell was rang, that the, the dog stopped being, uh, uh, I would say himself, you know, he, he, he reacted as though he was ready to be shocked. The, the idea is that the more you do this, the more you, you start to think that whatever you're doing, nothing can be done, right? You are uh, deprived of the ability of uh, change your behavior. We'll discuss it further when we will um, uh, analyze terms such as uh, uh, locus of control, for instance, right? A locus of responsibility, whether we feel that the world is a place that uh, is welcoming or not, whether we can do things, we can give our contribution, whether we're deprived of any real free will to change uh, the patterns, to change our lives, okay? But for now, think about that Seligman, you know, was able to discuss that and analyze the responsiveness, right? And furthermore, uh, the fact that a behavior becomes part of your identity, uh, it's also connected to basic psychological needs. We mentioned Abraham Maslow before, but uh, in, in this slide, you can see here, there are three basic psychological needs to feel positive emotion, okay? Again, emotion is moving us, right? A motivator, right? To engage in activities that will give life meaning and purpose, and then to have a positive relationship with others. The other um, experiment, we had a series of experiments that uh, I cited here in this slide, is the one by uh, Garcia and Curling, right? Uh, and every time you hear these two, uh, two names, you should think of taste aversion, right? So taste aversion is an acquired uh, response, an acquired reaction to the smell or taste, okay, that the subject is supposed to before getting sick, right? So selective association effects. Rats made nauseous following exposure to novel taste or audiovisual compound stimulus acquire a much stronger version to the taste stimulus than the audiovisual component. Think of this, if you've been paired, you know, you've been showing um, flowers and you expect something bad to them, feel nauseated, or if you've shown, I don't know, a viper or poisonous snake, uh, the, the snake by definition seems to already be um, a predictor of something bad is happening, right? So, um, and, and these are also related to the, the, the connection between smell and taste, which we'll, we'll discuss uh, further. Now, a few more things about behavioral patterns, okay? Uh, you have chaining, shaping, and instinctive drift. Uh, chaining defines the fact that complex behavior are built on discrete, previously mastered step, okay? So you connect multiple behavior, multiple steps, okay? You press, like this, press, like this. So you chain behaviors, you have sequence of behavior, right? Shaping is success approximation to the desired behavior, right? So you want to teach the child how to perform a test. You do this in success approximation, getting closer and closer to the behavior that you desire, right? So it's one of the common um, aspects of um, uh, pedagogical um, aspects from um, conditioning. But then the interesting thing is that you don't always have uh, conditioning working all the time. Okay, so this really uh, contradicts the studies that um, we, we previously uh, identified, especially the horrible study and the interpretation by Watson. Okay, so the fact that we do have an inner nature, right? We have an instinctive drift, and, and it's also connected to the fact that. Our, our nature determines our reaction. It's not just that we are a uh, blank slate that are forced to, uh, to react to things that the experimenters will, will, will tell us to do, okay? So it, it's pretty much the tendency, the instincts, you could say, uh, of reverting back to the previous behavior, right? So the fact that it doesn't matter how much we're conditioned, eventually we'll go back, right? Uh, so, for instance, um, uh, um, a classical example with 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 with, uh, um, with um, pigs or, or even raccoons. You know, raccoons were taught to, to deposit wooden tokens in in a, in a container, right? Uh, and they were given food as, as as of course as a positive reinforcement as as a uh, as a reward, right? But then eventually the raccoons they, they began to associate the tokens with food and and treated them as they would food in the wild. So it kind of uh, miss the, the conditioning point here. All right, um, then um, other two um, um, 
psychology would like you to remember, Edward Tolman and Charles Hanzik, and uh, latent learning, cognitive math, uh, and, uh, and the fact that we can learn even without immediate uh, reinforcement. So um, it, it's something that is, is, um, is very, very important because besides uh, talking about the process itself, um, it's, um, uh, it's, it's, it's also uh, time frame based, context based, right? So I don't know, let's assume that, uh, I don't know, you're just um, going about your day um, and, um, and you always drive through the same road, right? And, and then you notice, I don't know, an old shop on your left side, right? You don't think of much, you just, you just notice that. But then you drive your, your motorcycle, you know, you know, down the same avenue, right? And, and, then, and then you anticipate something associated to that store. For instance, the fact that uh, the store was right before, I don't know, uh, the entrance to the high or something like that, right? And this is actually late learning, that, that we have this inner map uh, maze, right? Think about the, the minotaur. Put the the, the little <laughs> the little image here of the minotaur and uh, uh, and the little rat here. That you know, eventually you you master that. You remember things and you you create a map. This is also interesting. It's connected to a variety of study uh, um, on consciousness, uh, especially the one that we will we'll encounter further. Uh, that uh, will uh, tell us how this is connected to, for instance, um, um, things such as um, um, partial awareness uh, or um, uh, problems in the uh, left of the visual field, et cetera, et cetera. So neglect and so on and so forth. Next slide, um, uh, Walter Michel, okay. Uh, the concept of gratification and delay gratification as a predictor. Uh, in this marshmallow test for his report, Walter Michel was uh, one of the experimenters that um, he, he's originally Austrian, um, uh, but you know, worked in the, in the US uh, for, for many, many, many years. And in these marshmallow tests, uh, the children were asked to have these two options. Either they could have one marshmallow right away, or if they could wait for the um, observer, the, the researcher, the assistant, to come back and it will resist the temptation of eating the marshmallow, they could get two marshmallows after a certain amount of time. I think it was 15 minutes. And some children just shout the marshmallow in their mouth. Some children were able to wait for this bigger prize. And you know, this is interesting because it was a follow over time. Children were followed over time. And the more they were able to wait, the more their lives were associated with a variety of positive um, elements, such as. Um, being able to wait, determine higher academic achievement, for instance, um, better health outcome, et cetera, et cetera. And you know this because you're, you're here studying psychology with me, uh, not because you're studying with me, but you're studying in general. So you're able to delay gratification. For instance, you decide to watch this video rather than watch, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, funny failed videos or horrible day. <laughs> compilations on YouTube to so you delay to have fun things to watch in order to achieve a bigger goal, right? Now, I hope that this will be a progressive, uh, um, if I may say, a progressive benefit overall. It's not just, it's just not just chaining, right? But what we said earlier, like the fact that you have shaping, so excessive approximation to the desired behavior. So eventually you'll be so uh, in love with psychology that this will become your reward. But, but but this explains why a lot of people can postpone a smaller level of happiness in order to achieve a much bigger one. This has a variety of uh, theological, T-H-E-O-L, et cetera, implication as well as teleological, T-E-L-E-O, -E -E et cetera, implications, because you can create a, not just a map of what's going on right away, as in the latent learning cognitive map, but you can predict the future, right? You can understand that sacrifice, making something sacred, is for a higher good, okay? And will ultimately determine a different outcome in life and life choices. Okay, now let's talk about the premium principle. Uh, 
supreme principle. All right, so the David Freeman principle, David Freeman is the author, it's also called the relativity theory of reinforcements uh, of operant conditioning, which is pretty straightforward for NHLL, a more desirable behavior, more desirable activity, which is connected to high probability, can be utilized to reinforce a less desirable one or a low probability. So high probability, reinforce a low probability. So the fact that something that you like can be used to do something that you don't like. For instance, if you uh, pick up your toys in your room as a child, I will give you the chance to go out and play with your friends, okay? If you study for the quiz today, then tomorrow we're going to watch a movie or something like that, right? Now, this is tricky because uh, it's not always true, okay, uh, that a more desirable behavior can be utilized to reinforce a less desirable one. Because the issue is that, I mean, it, it does work, but that's the problem. And sometimes it works too well. So, for instance, um, let's see the problem is, for instance, with, with schools, when you use this to motivate a child, you know, in, in and one of the issues that, in my estimation, is, is uh, affecting a lot of the U.S. school system compared to other um, areas in the world is that you give a lot of praise to children, for instance, in the form of, I don't know, tokens or little stars, etc., to motivate their behavior. But then the risk is that they might do something that they already like, and then once they do that, expecting a reward, they'll start doing that just because of the reward. Example. Children might like to uh, draw something, okay? And you want to praise them, and then you give them, I don't know, a star every time they draw. The risk is that at first they might be motivated, but then they will not like drawing for the sake of drawing. They'll only do that in order to get the star. And that's really a complicated thing. So it's, it's, it's uh, um, the, the, the immedio es virtus, the, the Romans, the Latins, the ancient Italians used to say, the virtue is in the middle. All right, um, another study I want you to remember. Uh, I want to remember the name of Albert Bandura. Albert Bandura. All right. And the Bobo doll experiment. Bobo doll experiment. All right. Albert Bandura um, of uh, Ukrainian, uh, Polish descent, uh, working in Canada, um, one of the most uh, cited psychologists ever. Uh, he might be actually the most cited psychologist uh, um, when he was still alive. He, uh, he passed on recently. He is very famous for a variety of things, but possibly SCT and the Bobo Bell experiment are the most famous one. We will talk about SCT, social learning theory, later on. But uh, the bubble doll experiment is one of the most uh, important ones that has to do with modeling, aggressive versus non-aggressive behavior, interpretation and judgment, reinforcement and punishment. The idea is that uh, we are vicarious learners. Okay? So we can model our behavior based on what we are shown. And in this picture here, you can see the child uh, using a hammer to hit this bubble doll. It's kind of bouncing. Uh, doll because the behavior was observed in an adult doing the same thing. So, for instance, if you see that a lot of bad things happen out there, okay, and these things are simply neither rewarded, but you just observe, neither rewarded nor punished, but you see them, you might copy them, but you might be more likely to copy them if these things are viewed and rewarded as positive. Okay, so for instance, uh, you see someone else um, punching this doll. And you might start doing the same thing or between having a choice, uh, sorry, having a choice between uh, having a feather, having a hammer, and you can either caress the doll with a feather or punch the doll or grab the hammer and just smash the hammer against the doll. And if you see others, uh, other um, individuals started doing the same, especially if those subjects are something you look up to, adults, there's some sort of admiration and praise, some sort of hierarchy, you're more likely to do that. Or the opposite, if you observe this behavior, so this environmental components um, uh, in, in reverse. Uh, there's a lot of application to this. One of the application is thinking about 
things such as are violent movies, violent video games more likely to promote this behavior? Will violent video games make us more aggressive or will they allow us to vent and let go of steam? We'll, we'll discuss that in, uh, in a future lecture, but the bubble experiments and the social learning theories, this is vicarious learning and modding is very, very important. All right, um, abstract learning, uh, Bob Kankula, um, abstract learning as well as inside learning, something that um, has to do with, with uh, this, this inner inside, this, this shaping element, it's, it's connected to, uh, uh, to the Gestalt uh, psychology, right? So um, he, he became famous for the, the study of chimpanzee, right? This empirical study of chimpanzee problem solving, right? Um, and uh, it really changes uh, a lot of the, the, the previous um, expectations, so to speak, uh, of, of problem solving, right? So um, it, it's, it's, it's uh, connected with Gestalt as the shaping, this forming psychology, Gestalt psychology in German, okay? That rejected the, the, the basic principle of, of empiricism, structuralism, uh, philosophy, which in themselves are heirs of um, positivism, British positivism and empiricism uh, that that originated in the uh, 1800s, and even even you know even before that, pretty much after the French Revolution, so on and so forth, all the way until almost until present time, you could say. So uh, the, the idea is this: that uh, in his experiments, uh, Killer was able to demonstrate his abstract learning, his insight, so that the chimpanzee, right, that they were not able to solve their problems. By means of behavioral trial and error, right, which is exactly what we, we, we observe so far, the progressive training and approximation, etc., right, not by trial and error, but by sudden comprehension of the situation. Um, and 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 this this uh, this um, sudden comprehension is almost like eureka moment, right? Eureka moment, this insight, which in itself is almost um, a, a divine sparkle, which is really interesting that in terms of the connection between. Empirical sciences and I don't know it is a uh, uh, idealism. Okay, idealism is not in terms of idealized or idealism in terms of philosophy, but it's this idea it just comes to us that that uh, sparkles something in us um, that really uh, create enthusiasm from an etymological uh, perspective. Enthusiasm really means being being infused with sacred fire, this divine light. Now. The idea here is to either increase the likelihood of a behavior or decrease the likelihood of a behavior by either adding or subtracting things, okay? And you have a combination of all these four elements. So increase behavior, adding, increase behavior, subtracting, decrease behavior, adding, decrease behavior, subtracting, all these four. All right, so let's give us uh, some examples. So imagine that this is a traffic light, okay? And I'll do this so hopefully you will uh, will be able to uh, to um, help you understand what things are. Let's assume that the green light is on the bottom, right? And that the red light is on top, which is exactly how you find it in uh, um, in um, real traffic lights and. And so this will also help the one of you that might not actually see colors clearly here, especially on, on the video. So at least you can rely on the position of this light, okay? We'll forget about the, the, the yellow light, the, the orange yellow light in the center, okay? And we will use the green light to say that something is a reinforcer, okay? A reinforcer. Okay, so let's call the process reinforcement, okay? So something that reinforces, force as in powers, makes it more likely to occur. Reinforcement, a behavior that makes, that it becomes more likely to occur, okay? more likely reinforcement. Punishment will be the term that we associate to the red light, punishment, okay? Again, a behavior that is less likely to occur. So please, please, please don't think of these two in ethical or moral terms. We're not talking about good and bad, okay? We're talking about 
the likelihood that a behavior is increased, okay, that you will observe the same behavior again and again, versus the likelihood that the behavior will be decreased, okay? Now, notice here that for each of these two categories, you have plus and minus, okay? So you will have a positive reinforcement, okay? And a negative reinforcement, okay? Same thing for punishment. You will have a positive punishment and a negative punishment. I know this sounds to be uh, counterintuitive a little bit, but let's see how this applies uh, into real life examples. Okay, let's let's think about studying since that's what we're doing here, okay? Uh, let's use the same situation, which is exactly what you find in, in the textbook, if you, if you have a textbook. Um, and let's see how this apply to changing the behavior, okay? So let's assume that uh, studying is good. Spoiler alert, yes, it is good for you. But let's assume that that's simply what we want to observe, okay? For the sake of uh, the study, we should never assume anything. We want to what? Increase the behavior, which is studying. So our X, okay, is now uh, increase, increase studying, okay? Studying, okay? Oops, the opposite. Okay, increase studying. All right. Now, what should we do in order to do that? If we want to increase studying, which one should we pick? We want to increase the likelihood that this behavior will be there more and more. We want to reinforce studying, okay? We want to make sure the behavior is increased, okay? So what can we do to do that? For instance, we can add something in the case of academia, I could add a good grade, an A or an A plus, okay? You will enjoy, hopefully, the grades that you will receive if you study it, and this will create a positive loop whereby you study more and more because you like to have that, okay? Now, you also want to reinforce the behavior, for instance, by removing something, okay? For instance, you might what? You might want to remove something that keeps you stuck, okay? For instance, let's assume that this is the um, the quiz that you need to prepare for for next week, okay? And if you study hard, you will remove the quiz from the remainder of the quizzes for the semester. So you remove something in order to reinforce studying. Each quiz you master, you will be able to kind of check, 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 and remove that, okay? Now, what about punishment, okay? Punishment is something that decreases the likelihood of the behavior. So let's assume that you still want to increase studying, but the thing that you observed uh, prevents you from studying is, I don't know, partying all the time, okay? So you want to increase studying, and that's called the Y here. You want to decrease, decrease partying all the time, okay? Partying all the time. All right. In this case, because you want to decrease parting, the decrease in the behavior is a punishment, okay? So what you want to do, let's assume that you add something, okay? If you party all the time, okay, you add some element that will make you feel less good about yourself. Now, I'm going to give you a very bad example here. Don't do this, okay? It's pretty unethical. Um, you add some sense of, I don't know, being... Uh, uh, being uh, made fun of, being ridiculed by your classmates because you're not as smart as they are. Please don't do that. But what I'm trying to say is that it's not punishment itself, but you decrease what? You decrease uh, parting because you add this feeling made fun of, this, this sense of um, uh, being inadequate, okay? So you add that and you will have as an end result that you decrease parting, which will eventually leave more room for studying. Or you can remove something, okay? So that will force you to uh, decrease parting as well. For instance, you might remove, I don't know, the music that you like at the party, okay? So now they only play um, hip hop, for instance, and you don't like hip hop, no, you should like hip hop, I'm just kidding. 
but you don't like that. So you remove um, something that was previously a simulation to go party, and now the result is that you decrease parting, making more room for that. So these are a lot of uh, examples. To be fair, I'm associating two different things here, okay? You could also make the more straightforward example with punishment and reinforcement. Uh, for instance, in the first case, this is exactly how you find in textbook, uh, the negative reinforcement will be nagging, okay? So you reinforce studying by removing nagging. Please study, please study, please study. Hey, I got an A. All right, I don't have to nag you anymore. So remove the nagging in order to achieve the same thing. Um, or, uh, for instance, um, uh, in terms of spending time with friends, in the punim punishment element, if you still want to increase studying, so you, re you remove this for, for a second, let's remove this and just focus on increasing studying. You can say, uh, if you study more, you will spend more time with your friends because you already did your job right, so to speak, uh, versus uh, being ridiculed at friends would be if they make fun of you for studying and choosing that instead of, of partying. So these are just a few examples. Uh, all right, great. So let's let, let's continue here because um, we're only talking about um, uh, reinforcers and 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 punishers here, pu punishment and reinforcement. Um, and of course, the primary and secondary, as we have seen. Uh, but time, schedule, ratio also play a significant role. Okay, so um, this is another uh, thing to to keep in mind that. Um, when we, we study operant conditioning, it's not enough to think about a behavior as one thing only, even if it's more than one, even if you have um, uh, secondary uh, reinforcement, okay? Um, we should also think about it in terms of um, scheduling and ratio, okay? So what, what is the, let's use this term, rhythm, Schedule and ratio of condition. Okay. Now um, let's think of this uh, from the perspective of uh, gambling. Okay. Now with gambling, the issue is that you don't always know what to expect. Okay. So in the example that we have seen, there are specific things that are regular in terms of the expectation. Okay, so the expectation is pretty straightforward. Okay. So you know that every time you do something, something happens. Okay. And some of the things that uh, we, we want to remember is the difference between, for instance, um, I don't know. Um, every time uh, let's think about the credit card for instance okay every time i make a payment to the credit card okay then what i own to the bank is less and less now you can schedule those payments for instance you pay i don't know um hundred dollars a month okay and each month you have the same amount that you will give to the bank. Okay? So you have a, a schedule that is fixed, okay? A consistent schedule, okay? But you might also want to decide one month to pay 200 or $300, okay? So that the whole expectation now is changed in the future. A very different situation is, for instance, we think about the paycheck, okay? Which is not directly linked to the amount or quality of work you put in. In other words, let's assume that you make $1,000 a month, okay? Does not matter if you were more or less than a month, you might be able to change the quantity itself if the uh, job position will allow you to do some um, extra hours, for instance, uh, or some volunteer added activities or, or um, job associated training, something of that sort, but otherwise, Beside the amount itself, you might not be able to change when you're going to be paid every two weeks or once a month, for instance. So you can work more and more and more, and yet your expectation is still constructed upon a very specific time frame. Okay, so it will not change when you're going to get paid. All right, so let's let's start to put this into uh, categories and labels because we we need to talk about the same thing in psychology to make sure that we all understand. So first of all. Let's talk about ratio, okay? So let's talk about a fixed 
ratio and a variable ratio okay variable ratio okay okay so let's think about it what will be a fixed ratio okay uh a fixed ratio will be a vending machine okay this is a vending machine okay vending machine okay where the expectation is straightforward okay a variable ratio will be uh a slot machine okay slot machine where you might press and press and press and press and sometimes you might get something sometimes you might get more or less sometimes you won't get anything so as it implies it's completely variable all right so so we talked about ratio in the first case you put something in and you get something out straightforward fixed fixed ratio okay that's how vending machines work in the second uh, situation you put something in and that can be you know depending what type of gambling you and engage in hopefully none whether you do something you press a level whatever it is there is a variable ratio because you don't know exactly what to expect okay now there's something else that we want to add beside the ratio and this would be the interval okay interval okay right and even in this case you have a fixed interval and a variable interval okay so think of the fixed interval for instance what we just discussed your paycheck okay your paycheck will arrive every Friday or every other Friday for instance okay doesn't matter what you do at work what kind of, of, of skills you use how much you work okay again we're not talking about the, the quantity okay the, the, the financial value of that check you might get more or less money but the point is that you will get your check at a fixed interval every other Friday for instance what be a variable interval well that could be something like random quizzes right random quizzes in a in a class right a course whereby you don't really know when you're gonna get the quiz uh, and and therefore you are waiting for something without having any specific certainty of the interval all right you might also wonder though um how this plays out in terms of behavioral okay behavioral responses okay so if we could put all of this into a um um a um, diagram here okay Instagram okay uh or actually let me let me uh do this let me associate specific colors here so fixed ratio will be uh blue okay uh variable ratio will be green okay uh fixed interval will be red but a continuous line okay and variable interval uh will be also red but this time dotted line okay so if this is the diagram here okay let's assume that you have a specific fixed ratio okay and let's assume that just as an example uh, of the of the study, okay, talking about operant conditioning, we're talking about pressing a lever here. So this is what we're going to do now. So again, John Watson from from uh, the University of Chicago and then and, and John Hopkins uh, was one of the the primary authors uh, and inventors of, of behaviorism. But of course, we have to think about Watson. We have to think about uh, Thorndike. We have to think about about uh, James. But the point was that behaviors uh play the most important role because it's, we're talking about observable actions not psychoanalysis not uh, inner mind so talking about uh, environment and also there's no difference between any type of uh, uh animal so we are exactly the same thing as any other animal and our behavior is the only thing that we, we need to uh, uh respond to now 
with operant conditioning in itself, okay, uh, Thorndike and Skinner um, connected the stimulus and response. You can see there's a, a Skinner box here, <laughs> um, um, and the and and the food and the and the and the cat reacting to it, pressing the level to try to escape this box, and you know making a, making assumption about how uh, hard the cat the cat fought, so to speak. Um, uh, in order to reach the food. So B.F. Skinner has uh, the study of consequences of responses, inferring the, the model of behavior based on the responses. So the upper response in itself is an action that operates on the environment to produce some consequences, okay? So in classic conditioning, you have uh, um, um, conditional stimulus and conditional response. In operant conditioning, which is also called instrumental um, conditioning, a conditional response are emitted, right? So conditional responses are operants, which is uh, exactly the, the the point here. So um, in operant conditioning, you have the, this 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 behavior that represents the, a learning curve, the cat pressing on a lever, and the law of effect that determines the consequences of a response uh, as determined of whether it is is strengthened or weakened. So this is the the, the law of effects, reward, strengthen, no reward, weakened, and punishment, very weakened response. So um, this is one of the, the most important things in operant conditioning, and you have primary reinforcers and secondary enforcers. Think of, of primary enforcers as, I don't know, the, the pyramid of need by Abraham Maslow. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about Maslow uh, in, uh, in um, weeks, I believe, 10 and 11. But primary reinforcers are food and, and physical pain, especially, or thirst, right? And then second reinforcers, anything that is connected to it. So, for instance, money doesn't uh, uh, quench your thirst. Money does not make you less hungry. But you could use money to buy food, right? So it's a connected attention. Then, you know, any type of more emotional identity-based uh, reinforcers, such as attention or, or, or praise, et cetera, admiration, okay? All right, so... What is this uh, representing here in practice? So you have this box, right? That allowed uh, Skinner to, to observe this behavior over time, right? And so what is in the box? You have this, this cat, or it can be a rat, you know, this, this, this operant box. And, and there's a section where you can put food in the box. And you can have a mouse or a cat or a rat that, that is hungry, of course. And uh, as you can see, the, the, this cat is, is pretty hungry here. It's kind of black metal cat. And um, um, and um, in the experimentation, of course, you want to keep the animal hungry so that you they're always motivated to to learn to get to the food, right? Um, so you you see how important it is to connect um, operant conditioning to learning and motivation, okay? And the opposite, be demotivated, being depressed, learn helpless, and so on and so forth. So you have uh, a food dispenser, and uh, and the animal can can eat when the animal performs a, a specific behavior, like a lever, for instance, every time the cat presses on the lever or the mouse or the rat presses on the lever, then the food will be dropped in the, in the, in the box and, and you'll get the, the reward, right? Or in the case of pigeons, there are, there are discs that pigeon can peck at, as we'll see, um, and, um, and um, th that's the behavior you, you observe, right? So, uh, and then the box was connected to a device that, that, um, that pretty much, uh, that um, would, would march. So every time uh, <coughs> this will happen, there was a, a, a time uh, frame and, and uh, you could calculate how the, the behavior occurred over time. So uh, there will be a line that will tell us that the total number of lever press over time. And this will allow, the, this allow Skinner and the experiment to, to study different schedules of reinforcement, okay, which is the one we will discuss next. So you have uh, continuous reinforcement or intermittent reinforcement, right? So only rewarding the animal a certain time for a certain number of lever presses will determine a specific behavior, okay? So this has to do with what? With schedules, right? Schedules of... Uh, um, of uh, uh, reinforcement, uh, and this is one of the essential elements of um, of uh, operant conditioning, which will determine really how how we can have a predictive power uh, in understanding the behavior uh, of animals. So, 
you might have, as you can see in the slide, you have fixed ratio, right? Uh, that um, uh, re represents uh, a, a connection between one food pellet, one drop of food, each time you press lever. So if you have five lever presses, it could be 10 or one, but this is a uh, reinforcement that when one lever press gets one uh, food pellet every time. So it's a direct connect, right? If I do this three times, I'll get it three times, right? I get, so if I press the lever three times, I'll get a food uh, uh, pellet okay, for, for the pigeon or I get my, my, my reward. So this is really important um, to understand in terms of fixed uh, ratio. Now, then you have the variable ratio. Uh, in blue, you have the fixed interval and in yellow, you have the variable interval. So you notice the differences in, in the curve here of, of, uh, of responding, right? So uh, fixed ratio, as I mentioned before, could be something like, like a bending machine, right? Um, the variable ratio could be you know, like a, a more unpredictable. So in example, um, that that um, uh, I give earlier, you, you, you sometimes you press five times and you get food. Sometimes you press fifteen, you get food. So it's always changing. It's it's unpredictable, um, and it has to do more like a slot machine, for instance, right? So um, you could it, you you don't know what's going to happen, right? Then you have a, a fixed interval, right? So here is in in blue and in in this slide here, and that's also very interesting because you have some set amount of time that is fixed and you can get a certain amount of food or of reward during that specific um, interval, right? I mentioned the, the, the paycheck, right? And so you, we went from a fixed ratio to variable ratio. Now the first interval is the fixed interval. Now the very last one, okay, is the variable interval, okay? So you don't know, you don't know how long you have to wait before the next will be available. So. What, what, what would be a good example of this? Well, uh, a good example is this uncertainty that is connected to, I think I mentioned a, a quiz in school, a pop quiz. You, you, don't, you really don't know when, when it's going to happen. So it's, it's very it's unpredictable part that will, will uh, create this, this sense of uh, really expectation. So now if you, if you see that the, each time the, the schedules are, are shown here, you see that uh, there is a different curve, okay? And, and this is really uh, interesting. So, so if you have the, 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 uh, the, the fixed ratio here, you see something like, you know, a steady, uh, a steady curve, right, in green here. Um, and, and then if you have a variable ratio, slightly steeper, right? The fixed interval has this kind of uh, downward curve, and then the variable interval is, is the, the yellow one. So, so how, how you, you get the, this, this uh, uh, diagram here? Well, of course, because the, the, the Skinner box was attached to this uh, time measurement system. So you have time in minutes and then the cumulative number of responses, and there was a pen attached to it. So each time the lever uh, was pressed by the animal, the pen clicks up, and so it's, it's, it's really adding up over time uh, the total uh, numbers of uh, pressing the lever, the number of behavior. So uh, each schedule would, would tell us something more. So with a fixed ratio, a ratio, every certain number of lever presses, you will get a food pellet, right? So if our cat is doing that, you know, let's say uh, three, four, six times, seven times, uh, the cat is going to quickly press this six times and then we'll stop and eat the food pellet, right? So that's the kind of, the, you can see the, the scale, right? So he's going to press it six more times, seven more times, whatever it is, eat the food pellet, and then, you know, he'll press it again. So there's a, there's a line that each time you see this, Kind of climbing thing, right? With this little stop and up and up and out. You get uh, six behaviors, seven behaviors in a row, then a foot pedal, seven, and so on and so forth. Now, this is a fixed ratio. If you see the variable ratio, which is very, very interesting here, the variable ratio in red, and now what's happening here? Well, the, the cats will press it rapidly bam, 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 because he does not know which press is going to what, deliver the food, deliver the reward. It's always changing, right? A variable ratio. So so have to press it very rapidly, bam, 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 bam. For instance, like, I don't know, um, 20 times and then he gets food, right? Then he will press it like, I don't know, five times I will get food. And then the next time he has to press it 25 more times. So he'll do it very rapidly because he does not know, right? 
uh, and and he's hoping, and that's really the connection between this variable, this variability, right? This variable uh, ratio and the hope you're gonna get the reward, right? So it's hoping that the next price is going to be the one, right? Which is really, really fascinating in behavioral uh, sense. So, um, so it, it's, it's exactly what happens in, in a slot machine, right? So you just stay there and hope for something. You just do the behavior and you again, 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 because you don't know what, what to, to expect. And that's precisely why the variable ratio, ratio is very resistant to extinction. It's a behavior that is self-motivated to speak. And that's why it's so addictive, right? It is connection, right? Addiction and variable ratio. Addiction and gambling, for instance. We're very resistant to extinction, right? So uh, the, the animal will keep pressing very rapidly because he does not know that the food, for instance, has stopped, right? It can be any number of, of times, okay? Now, if we move on and we see a fixed ratio, okay, by, by comparison, okay, the extinction occurs more rapidly because you, you just remember. You just remember the difference between, a, you know, what happens in a vending machine where you know what to expect in a slot machine, right? So this is very, 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 uh, very important because uh, that's how you interpret um, addiction from a very straightforward scientific perspective. Um, and you can already tell what's happening there, okay? Now, um, if you now you have a variable interval, right? You press the button, press the lever that you have uh, food um, delivered to you at the reward. And it, there's, there's no point in pressing because you already got it, right? So it's very interval, but there is going to be, you know, another, I don't know, five, six minutes or one or two before, uh, before you, 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 you press again, right? You might say, well, it's, it's, it's been about, you know, three minutes. So I'll, I'll press the, the, the lever again and, 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 and then you get this, this new, new uh, pattern, right? So you have rest periods that are followed by a rapid increase in behavior, followed again by a rest, followed by a rapid increase, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, think of uh, starting, right? So if you have a, 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 a fixed time between intervals as opposed to a variable time of the interval, right? So once you're done, you're done, right? I think of the, the page as well, right? And um, you, 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 you observe the same pattern, right? So, but if you don't know when the test is coming, you can have two tests in a row, you can have um, three tests, uh, two weeks apart, um, you, you're, you're not going to be able to, to cram every now. What you, you're probably going to do is to have a, uh, um, this more balanced, this slow, uh, steady response, right? Because you, you, um, you're, you don't know what happens in a variable interval, right? So in, in terms of what the animal is doing, you, if you were the animal, you would press the level every once in a while to, you know, just check, right? Can I get it? Maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe can wait a little bit, try again. So it's a slow and steady rate of behavior, right? Which is again uh, associated with this variable uh, interval uh, schedule, right? Which what you can see in yellow. So um, which pretty much has to do with the reward at random, right? Um, so this is really really uh, interesting here, right? Because uh, it's it's you know the animals are not really didn't have to do anything, right? They just drop food into a cage at random times, unpredictable. Um, now, uh, if you if you are this animal, right, and if, if food is just delivered to you, you don't you don't have to do anything. Just wait, wait an hour, right? Uh, that's what you expect, right? You just you just you know wait and see. It's completely random. What's the point? But what the experiment actually uh, demonstrated is, is what we said that uh, uh, Skinner uh, defined as superstitious behavior, right? That that uh, they the, these animals would do something, and the, the food magically would drop there. And they associate that with, with, with you know, expecting a, a, a reward. Now, instead of pressing the lever, maybe they just turn their heads, uh, you know, the, the animal, I don't know, the, the cat might have, you know, meowed and then the food came. And so the cat would do this over and over again, or the pigeon would turn left or go in circles multiple times, thinking that that would stimulate the food to drop in, which, of course, not not the case. Again, superstition as this false irrational belief, okay? And the etymology is kind of interesting because it means to to stand above, to stay to, to, to stay on top of things, which we, we usually associate to something good, very rational. I'm, I'm on top of things, right? But superstition is to associate a 
concept or interpretation when there is not enough evidence, right? Connecting dots when there are none. But yet again, this is a fascinating things that uh, behaviorism is is able to uh, to indicate. So um, and it's also very very interesting because um, um, if, if you think about um, similar studies, that's where, where where the connection between interpretation and belief come together. Now, the interesting thing is that Skinner defined this as superstition behavior, um, but he was completely wrong, not because the term itself is not accurate, but because if you really think about it, this actually assumes something that is in itself reinforcing. Now, if you really think about that from a moral and ethical standpoint, if you want to increase the likelihood of a specific behavior, assuming specific behavior is universally correct and good and just and truth, okay, um, then which thing among all these possible schedule ratio um, and intervals that we just discussed, would you pick? Well, you would pick the most random of them all because it will increase your behavior, will increase everything about it. And that's the point. Think of what happens in, for instance, prayer. You never know what's going to happen, okay? And the false assumption is that what's the point of doing that? Because I don't have any certainty. It's completely anti-scientific, not a scientific but I will not obtain anything. Well, you know, the uh, science clearly demonstrated, you know, using all these examples and many, many others that we'll encounter in the next few weeks, that if you want to increase that behavior, randomness is the best option. Randomness is not knowing expectation. And that's precisely why I link that to, for instance, thinking about uh, transcendental elements such as an afterlife or, or prayer or, or what happens to us or what I'm going to be in in five years from now or how can we predict our future. The fact that we don't know and we experience things randomly, okay, is actually what will increase what we are meant to be in the first place. So it's superstitious for sure, but in the correct etymological sense. All right, so that concludes uh, our week four for Introduce to Psychologists. Thank you very much. We covered a lot of subjects today. Uh, please feel free to um, let me know um, if you have any questions or comments. Um, otherwise, uh, you can also um, see the other materials uh, in the module, and you can also comment below if you so choose. But otherwise, I will see you all next week.